Good morning and welcome to the worship service here at the Fair Park Bible Fellowship. We're glad that you could join us and be a part of our assembly together. We are assembled together because the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of the brethren, for something supernatural takes place when we assemble together. The Spirit of God shows up in a profound way, a way that you cannot experience by looking at us on this live stream. Because when we connect, we're connecting with the Spirit of God that dwells within. The Bible says that when we confess Jesus, that the Holy Spirit takes up residency inside of us and gives us a capacity to know and understand the Word of God. And we're excited to be assembled here together and that you have joined us via this live stream. And it is our hope that you will experience a word that would edify, spiritually lift you up and cause you to see your Savior in a profound and unusual way, a way that will transform your life. God bless you and thank you for joining us. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, let us, uh, we got a special guest with us today uh, that I invited to come and be a part of our service today and to share her vision and what God has given to her. Stephanie and I, uh, Stephanie Berry and I met. She is a pro-life warrior. And so she ran into a pro-life warrior. <laughs> um, and, and she is, has an incredible testimony. I'll let her share some of that with you. Uh, in addition, uh, she has a vision that God, she shared with me that I said, you ought to share that. You ought to share that because we're here in the African American community. And when you look at the history of our relationship with this nation and the relationship that we have with ourselves, it is one that is marred and scarred. And uh, it is, is one that causes those of us who are African-American to raise the question, why is this happening? What's going on? Why us? And I think there's an answer to that. And I think God is, is about to do something extraordinary to answer our dilemma. And uh, the, the, I'm not going to steal her <laughs> testimony, but there's a dilemma here. And one that I think that is only answered within the word of God. And Satan has done much to deflect, distract, distort, and derail and disconnect us from God's truth. I think the time is coming when he's about to change that. And we're looking forward to that. Um, I love the Lord. He heard my cry and he pitied every, 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 every groan. Long as I live and trouble rise, I'll hasten to to his throne. I love the Lord. He heard my cry and he pitied every, every groan. He'll do that for you today. Long as I live and trouble rise, I'll hasten to 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 his throne. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. God has a throne that is available. 
Somebody asked the question, is there a bomb in Gilead? There is one. There is one. And you can have access to it only through one means, through Jesus who is the Christ. But there is no other name given unto men where they must be saved. The name is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Isn't that something? The truth, singular. The way, singular. The life, singular. He is the only way through which we are able to have reconciliation unto our God, our Savior, and our King. I want to invite Stephanie to come. And Stephanie, take five to ten minutes and share with you, with us, what God has put on your heart. Okay, be praying for me because five minutes will take a miracle, but I'm going to try. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, well, just really quickly, um, I had the honor of meeting uh, your pastor. Um, and you all don't know it, but I'm, I'm actually late. Oh, it's out? Okay. Um, I, I'm late in saying thank you to all of you, because you prayed for me. Your, your pastor told you the story of somebody who God led to uh, uh, go to a, an abortion, you know, I refuse to call it a clinic, and a clinic you give life, so it's, it's a death center. But, um, um, yeah, the Lord called me to go back to where I'm from. I'm from Ohio, and um, there was an um, abortion uh, death center there, and um, it, it was a, like a huge um, circle for me because my daddy, who was a doctor, um, hallelujah, glory to God, he was an orphan, and he grew up in church, and they told him he couldn't be a doctor. Maybe he could, you know, um, mow the lawns of the country club or something. But he had a teacher who would kept calling him Dr. Barry. And so he attended her in her last illness. We all got dressed up. I remember wearing a blue coat and a hat. Anyway, I'm going to stick to the subject. Um, but one day when um, I went back to Ohio with my, my family, um, I realized that there was an abortion death center near where my father used to have his office. And I had always meant to do something, you know. Oh, I'm against abortion. I mean to do something, but I never, other than saying I was against it and giving money here and there now and again. But that day it just hit me in the face. Anyway, making a long story short, when... Um, I went back to Ohio in June of this year. I crossed a line. Um, I went in with three other people um, to the abortion death center in Ohio in Cuyahoga Falls. And uh, hallelujah. We went all the way in. I, I had made an appointment. <laughs> and I didn't tell a lie. <laughs> uh, uh, I guess my voice sounds like light and cheery. <laughs> Anyway, they just gave me the appointment, and in, in Ohio, um, there's this 24-hour rule, so you have to, you know, first see them, and then the next, it has to be at least 24 hours, and you have to hear what they have to say, but the people who say it to you are in the abortion business. Anyway, um, uh, we went in with our little red roses, and we give red roses to the young women so that they know that they're precious and a treasure and the pearl of great price is inside of them. And, um, you know, and we offer real help, real help. And, you know, oh, be dressed, be fed, you know, all that, no. Anyway, so um, I, what happened was I went through, I, I saw a young woman. She, maybe she was, she's not a young woman, she's a teenager. She needed help, and she was shaking, shaking, shaking. And maybe she was 16. I'm hoping she was 16. And her mom was right next to her, like pushing her in. So anyway, to make a long story short, uh, gave her the rose, held her hand, told her everything is going to be all right. <laughs> I'm not from the South, but my parents are from the South and just keeps coming down. <laughs> everything is going to be all right. Anyway, and I told her we wouldn't leave her side. And I told her what I'll say to you. I said, I know how you feel. I've been where you stand. And I'm not judging you. 
I said, I've been alone, pregnant, and ashamed. I'll never leave your side. Jesus will never leave your side. We mean what we say. And you can put your baby into the hands of those who will raise that child if you choose not to. But if you choose to raise your baby, for three years we'll walk by you. We are not going to leave you. And at this point, you know, you know, the mom wasn't so happy because she, she thought I worked for Planned Parenthood. <laughs> Which I'm sorry about, you know. You know, that was, that was discrimination. But anyway, um, uh, you prayed for me because uh, after witnessing to the doctor and some staff, and everybody else was doing it too, the other three were doing it too, um, uh, we got arrested, I was handcuffed, put in a paddy wagon. <laughs> I'm just saying all this because I'm like, here I am, I'm in a paddy wagon now. And <laughs> but praise the Lord. Once inside though, I was the last one they took away. Um, I was in there by myself for about 20 minutes. So we were like on the floor just to show the police, look, this is not about you. We're not against the police, we're for the police. No one's going to kick you, bite you, curse you. We bless you. However, you're on the wrong side of this one. You should be defending the life in that womb. Amen. And uh, so I was the last one, but once inside, I stood up, I said, Lord, I'm inside. Break this altar of child sacrifice. Break it in our hearts and in our land. And everything I have to say in a few minutes remaining are connected to that. It's my belief, you know, I've, I've prayed about this, I believe the Lord has shown me that the blood of the infants from these altars of child sacrifice is the demonic shield. It's at the root. It's the demonic shield for child trafficking. You might not want your baby girl in here, actually, to be honest, because I'm going to say a few things. I'm going to try to say them. Yeah, I would, I would actually, at this point, I would get up and go. Um, yeah. It, 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 that's your decision back there, but it, it's a tough one. Okay. Um, it, it's a demonic shield for the war on men and women. It's a demonic shield for so much. But the Lord called me kind of in, in, a, in a whirlwind. I, w I was in New York and um, he spoke to me and he said, I want you to leave. You leave right away. Uh, if you delay, you will, the day will come when you will not be able to leave New York City. I'm sending you to Texas. He had spoken to me once before, years and years ago, 11 years ago. And he said something, he said, the Lord had said to me, and, and you, nobody has to believe this, this is just what I heard, okay, I'm not trying to, all right. I heard from him, and I wasn't even expecting it. He said to me, the defense of the nation will arise from Texas. And when he said that 11 years ago, I mean, we surely needed help, but I thought the defense of the nation, now I get it. Because I would tell people from Texas, I was in Missouri at the time, I would tell them and we'd all feel the Holy Spirit, but I forgot about it until last year. Well, anyway, you prayed for me to, get, to, to finish one thing. You prayed for me. You prayed that they wouldn't throw me in jail. <laughs> you prayed that I would get away. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. We were found guilty. Uh, guilty of criminal trespass. Our defense was necessity. If I walk by your house and and I see water coming out of the door. I'm going to walk into your house. If it's open, I'm going to turn the water faucet off. Have I trespassed you? I have. But there was a necessary reason. So that's what necessity is. Anyway, we, we, we lost all that. But um, I, I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, none of us, uh, they, they dismissed the jail sentence. The judge dismissed it. And um, uh, he left us with a fine. And... Uh, the thing is, though, we don't pay fines. We don't acknowledge the authority of any court on earth to fine us for saving the life of an unborn child. Okay, 
And my first act on coming to Texas within days, I mean, I, <laughs> God had given me the money, I was out, and I was in Dallas. And I didn't know that you all have, have such a prophetic history here and such a destiny here and that the first shot in the defense of the nation had already been fired, in my opinion, and that was the heartbeat bill. You know, I came on the 24th and the bill went into effect on September the 1st. And I'm like, oh my goodness, they really are. And I thought, okay, so Texas, here we go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, but, but to focus. Um, it took a while because, you know, I could do pro-life work anywhere, unfortunately. It's the problem is everywhere. But there was something specific the Lord was calling me to. And that was, um, we've got a border down here, the Tex-Mex border. And I don't know about all the points, you know, and, and to be honest with you, <laughs> I don't even really know the geography of the border, but I do know this. At a particular city, Del Rio, there's a, a long bridge, and underneath that bridge currently are 150,000 uh, immigrants, uh, illegal immigrants. And I, I love everybody, I do, but a lot of these people are criminals. And they come in um, selling, um, well, it, it's a list you'll find in Revelation. They're selling uh, witchcraft devices, in other words, fentanyl. Fentanyl, um, I know about fentanyl because Cleveland was the, I'm from Ohio, I was born in Ohio. And we led the nation in deaths from fentanyl. It's, it's extremely addictive, as you know, and it's a killer. Okay, enough fentanyl has come across the border since I've been here, I came August 23rd, to kill every man, woman, and child in California, Texas, and Florida. That's the caliber of person we have coming in, okay? But not only that, there's trafficking in human souls, but the devil is without pity. Children as young as three years old are being trafficked for sex. They're found sewn up in mattresses, discarded here and there, because you cannot maintain, it's not a lifestyle, it's, 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 it's something that's been foisted on them. Okay, so um, I, I won't go through the whole process, but what the Lord does with me is something percolates. And at, at a certain point, when I really contemplated it, I said, Lord, you have to do something, because I can't live on the same earth with this sin. I can't, not on my watch. And then he showed me that he was calling me to the border. One thing, the, the first thing that tipped me off is that there are a number of Haitians. Now, I'm not Haitian, um, but I speak almost fluent French. They don't speak French, they speak Creole, but there's enough of a connection that we'll be able, by the grace of God, to understand each other and to communicate. And um, the Lord showed me to go down there, to gather the children, to rescue, gather, feed, clothe, give them Jesus, and hold them close. Because these children, it's not as if you have families looking for a better life. I mean, some may be in there somehow, but I believe not really. These children have been scooped up off the streets like refuse, carried along, marched, Along. Talk about a forced march from Haiti all the way through up, up through whatever, you know, South American countries are coming to cross that border. At a certain zone on the Mexican side, um, you can use these children as currency. And if you don't have that currency, then they'll charge you like $15,000 more or something like that. You know, I don't know all of the demonic details, to be honest with you. But um, so that's my call. And uh, it, it's, it, it's amazing. The Lord gave me a certain amount of money, a low amount of money. And when I got that amount of money, he said, once you have that, leave. Head for the border. It came in this morning. I'm out. But I want to tell you something. That border has been breached. 
Now, I leave other aspects of our defense to, to other people, but I know this. If we lose the war with abortion, we've utterly lost. There's no weapon that they come up with anywhere that will ever make up for the loss. But that's not even the point. The point is the border's been breached. The people coming in believe in demonic power. They're criminals who base their amazing success on demonic power. We're talking Santeria, Muerte, which I, I don't know, I don't delve into the details, I just know it's one of the big death cults. It's Spanish for, for death, Muerte. And they, they worship these thingies, whatever. They're just demons, okay? And then um, um, many of the Haitians, voodoo, okay? So all of these things are being practiced at the border. All of these atrocities, because I said these are demonic things, what do, do demons like? Blood. So these things are happening. And again, you know, you, you have the Holy Spirit, you discern this, but the Lord showed me that they're trying to build a demonic portal at the border, and it must not happen. It must not happen. You can hear me. Um, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Thank you. But they are mighty in the Holy Ghost to the pulling down of strongholds. The thing that must not happen, brothers and sisters, is now that they've breached, and I keep talking about it because once it's on our land, it's God's going to say, why didn't you do anything? What did you do? I prayed. Or I didn't really know if we say that, will he not know the truth of it? Okay. The point being, it's now... If it, wasn't, if it wasn't a problem before, check out your Christianity because what's happening there, I know, stirs your heart. But it's on our, our side, and we must oppose it. And so while I've been, you know, uh, raising money here and there as the Lord would show me, he showed me also to speak to anyone who worships him. And I don't mean who sings, though singing is amazing. That's a commandment in the Bible, sing to the Lord. It's not if you feel like it. And it's a command, but it's also a weapon. Yeah. And, and I, I call you in the name of the Lord. Worship him at the border. All whose hearts are stirred, worship him at the border. Because if we worship him, if you hum a few bars to Jesus Christ the Lord, and it's in the frying pan, people hang from trees. Are, I'm saying are being hung from trees. It's, it's very wild. It's very evil. And they're utterly weak compared to our God. So in the name of Jesus, I just let that cry go out. It must be resisted. If we resist it, I don't think it takes too much for that to fall. We sing the songs of the Lord, it changes the atmosphere. The songs of the Lord are more powerful. Um, for me, and I, and I hope you remember and pray for me as the Lord puts it on your heart, for me it's a culmination of a lot of things because he's had me kill a lion and kill a bear. And so five smooth stones and one will work. Several million dollars would not be too much to throw at this problem, but all of it would be useless without Jesus. Amen. Okay. Um, should I go on with the wave? Just a little more, because I, I don't want to... Okay, okay. Um, uh, this is a vision I, I want to tell you. And, and um, it's really a vision for all people. You know how, uh, how the Lord chose the Jews for specific things, but it, it applies to all of us. So um, this is a, a beautiful church of, of all races, but I, I, I want to say that Okay, this wave, I was sitting in a, a prayer room in Kansas City, and this particular prayer room is open 24-7, and, and, and their call from God is to continue to worship the Lord until he comes. And so that's, that's, they have worship teams coming in all the time. And I was sitting there in something called the night watch. The night watch was from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., but I was there from midnight to 6. Okay, so it was about 4 a.m. on a day that was set aside 
on a day that was set aside to pray for uh, black, the black community, and especially worship leaders, singers, etc. And I was sitting there, it was about 4 a.m. And I was like, oh, ho-hum, and I was like coming in and out, and I was just losing focus, and all of a sudden I wasn't in the room. Um, I am so sorry. You are such a beautiful pianist, but I'm, I'm getting a little distracted. I'm trying to go fast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, all of a sudden, I wasn't in the room. And, and I don't get visions every day of the week, okay? I was like, okay, but I was very calm. And I was looking at a wave. It was a wave of an incredible blue. It was huge. It was coming toward me. And I heard my voice say, Lord, What is this wave? And Jesus said, it is a tsunami. Now you know tsunamis are huge. They're extraordinary. They're they're bigger than buildings. They're huge, huge waves. And I saw it and it came all the way toward me and then it froze like a Japanese painting. I said, Lord, but what is this wave? And he said, it is my spirit. And when he said, it is my spirit, actually when he said, it's a tsunami, I felt the Holy Spirit from the, go from the bottom of my feet all the way up through my body and out of my head. So this had happened twice. It is, it is a tsunami, it is my spirit. And then he broke it down for me. The, the seeing part of the vision was gone, but I was still hearing the Lord. That wave was revival. Revival coming for black Americans and those, whether they're white, Asian, Russian, Spanish, who've deeply, deeply associated themselves with black people. So much so that you would almost swear they were black. I don't know if you've ever met such people. I have. This wave is coming for them too. Is God a racist? No but he uses anything to bring everybody, okay? So um, um, this wave was a revival, but the thing about it is that it was more than a revival. He showed me, and I had a flash of the neighborhood I had last lived in with my children. It was a, a, a real tough little place, but whole communities will be transformed, not only spiritually, but economically, in every kind of way, socially. When your heart is changed, you get a certain culture about you. It was a total transformation. And while he was telling me about the total transformation, I was troubled. I said, but Lord, see, I'm still getting over the name tsunami. I said, tsunamis are dangerous. Yes, whoever was against this revival would die. It was an Ananias and Sapphira moment. Um, He said that the people characterized by disunity would be characterized by unity. And that a sound would come forth from black Americans, unique in beauty. He didn't say it, but I believe that sound is forgiveness. Uh, I want to make sure I'm not leaving out something. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So um, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? He said, write it down. Write it down and give it to the man who was overseeing the night watch. Well, the man overseeing the night watch was a man named Stuart Greaves, a a, a black pastor, etc. And he was... um, Coming down, he paces back and forward, and I was extremely shy. I said, Lord, I need some help. I can't go all the way over there and give him this piece of paper because I'd written it down. So all of a sudden, Stuart began to walk down the middle aisle, down like that, and I was sitting right about where you're sitting. And um, I stood up, I handed him the paper, he took it, he went and sat down. Now remember, there's a worship team praying. There are about 150 people in the room who are praying, you know, reading the Bible, praying for black people. Okay. Stuart reads it. He goes to the mic. He said, everybody to your feet. The spirit of of prophecy is in the room. Prophesy. Everybody jumped up. The spirit broke out. 
the worship team began to prophesy, prophesying revival, glory. Nobody, he didn't read what was written there, but it was all over the room. And I'd felt the Holy Spirit with an intensity that I had not felt before. The last thing that the Lord said to me before all of this was over that I wrote down on that piece of paper was that the spirit of Simon of Cyrene has come upon a holy and prophetic people. And I said, oh, who's that? That's why I believe I I needed to say this. I didn't recognize that he was speaking about black people. A holy and prophetic people. I knew who Simon of Cyrene was. I had looked it up in the Bible. Simon of Cyrene was coming in from the country that day. He was a black African man, a convert to Judaism. He was coming in that day, the day a man carrying a cross was walking down a certain road in Jerusalem, but he fell to the ground. And when Jesus fell to the ground the second time, the Roman soldiers looked into the crowd to choose a man to press into service, into temporary slavery, to carry the cross of the master. He found a black man, Simon of Cyrene, father of Alexander and Rufus. Check it out, it's in your Bible. I don't know if it was Alexander or Rufus who became a bishop in the first church, the first century church. This man, was pressed into slavery. And so he picked up a cross, that cross. He carried it to the central height of all history. He shouldered it. And I come to say to all of us, but I come to say to black people, it's time to shoulder that cross. We have a unique destiny. Sometimes we seem like the outpouring of the earth. Everybody hates us. We're not even really African, and I love Africans. I love everybody. I love my children are at least three races. My ex-husband is Irish and German. I love everybody. However, their destinies, and it's here. I believe that the time of the vision is upon us. So with whatever we have, just bring it forward. I can't say more than I'm given, and I've come to the end of what I've been given. I bless you for letting me speak this to you, and may the Holy Spirit move your heart. Thank you so much. I, I hope you heard something, uh, but it certainly, as I talked with Stephanie this past week, it, it, uh, it became obvious to me that God has touched her to do something about the border. And many of us are aware of the fact that there's something that is sinister and dark about the border. She was able to articulate it in a way that I could not that there is a demonic portal that's being constructed there through which these demonic practices are coming and flooding into our, our nation, flooding into our nation. And they are practicing that stuff in our nation, unfettered and unchecked, supported by our government who is paying these folks to come into our communities. And most of them, believe it or not, are landing in our community, black communities across America. So there's something that's going on, and I, I, I am trying to discern that and to understand it. But at the same time, I recognize that Steffi has an anointing. And I want to invest in that anointing. When I say I, I mean Fair Park Bible Fellowship Church. 
So we want to give something to her mission. Uh, I believe that we need to partner with her in the attempt to stop this flood that's coming into our communities. It's evil, it's dark, and it requires us not to turn our eyes from it, not to become bored and disassociated from it, but to associate with it to advance the kingdom of God. Well, we will have to answer for it. Because now you know. Now you know. And once you know, God expects you to do something about it. And some of us, all we can do is just maybe make an investment. And that's, that's fine. Others of us can maybe join her at the border. And pray and sing at the border. Now isn't it interesting that this is sort of happening around Christmas time when we're all engaged in self-indulgence, self-aggrandizement and protecting our schedules and our agendas. Well, I don't have time for that. I got to go see the Cowboys or whoever. But I, I, I believe God had a word for us today and I'm glad you had a time to hear from Stephanie. Now, when Stephanie and I met, we, we met and, and she shared her story with me and, and at the time they had no money. I said, that doesn't matter. Do you have any money or not? I said, they may dismiss the case. Isn't that what I said, Stephanie? I said, we'll pray that they'll dismiss the case because she was on her way to jail. <laughs> sure as I'm standing here, she was going to jail. But God intervened. And God has a way of doing that. And I want you to know he'll do it for you. Amen, because he is no respecter of persons. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that Stephanie had a chance to share with us what you placed on her heart. To the extent that we are to be participants with her, let it be known. There is someone sitting here today who may have a unction to go. And to stand with her maybe for a day, a week, whatever the case may be. And to pray the protection of of our God on our nation that you would deliver these young babies children who are being exploited and used for sexual perversion by men and women in our nation who have the financial resources to buy these children to exploit them we're trusting that you O oh God will make a difference through this call that you placed on her life and on our ministry here at the Fair Park Bible Fellowship. It is in the blessed name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Well, folks, I, I, I want you to know that um, today is an unusual day for me. I got a phone call from Atlanta. My brother is dying. And... Um, I'm going to have to rush out of here uh, to catch a flight to go to Atlanta to spend some time with my brother before he expires. He, his eternity is at stake. Where he will spend eternity is if God will allow me to get there in time enough to spend some time with him to again share the gospel. It's not like he hadn't heard it before. Mercy has already been extended, the truth be told. But I'm asking that God would do a special favor for me. And allow me to get to my brother one more time. Because when he closed his eyes this time, and he opens them and he doesn't know Jesus, his eternity is away from him. And that's not a thing that we want for our loved ones. So I'll ask that you pray for me. And what I'll do today is, is do a surface presentation of what I was going to do for you today. What we have been doing in our study of Christology is that we have been flying about 30,000 feet high. You have been flying high with me. As we've looked down at scripture in order to see a divine perspective, and it is essential for us to see this perspective that we need to see as he sees and know as he has made known in order for us to do what he has called us to do. And perspective has been the 
instrumentality through which you are engaged with the truth of God's word. Perspective is the divine facility or faculty to see all of the relevant data in a meaningful connection or relationship. Once you see that, then you are better able to participate in what I believe is the purpose of God. That you and I are engaged in uh, what is God is unfolding before us as he is moving in history, human history, to accomplish his purpose. God's purposes does not fit our design and what we want, but God has through the councils of eternity, have determined that these things that are unfolding around us are for his purpose. The question is, what is his purpose? I submit to you that God's purpose is to bring glory to himself. That's what this thing is all about. It's about bringing glory to himself. Now, in our study thus far, we said that there are two approaches or two camps in studying the perspective of God in the divine revelation. One camp we call that which is the theological covenants of God. It's called theological covenants because it is that which is deduced from scripture and it falls into three areas. The covenant of redemption, the covenant of works, and the covenant of grace. We've covered that. We've looked at that for the last several weeks, and we've sort of culminated our study this Wednesday. And we have concluded that their study or their representation is a deductive determination as to what God is doing. It is not specifically articulated within Scripture, meaning that you will not find the phrase covenant of redemption or covenant of works or covenant of grace. Although they're not specified within scripture, one can deduce from scripture that these ideas are there. But they're not specific, specifically articulated. And there are, the, the scriptures that are used are scant and, and, and there's not many of them. And so one can conclude that there are uh, deductions. But uh, the second camp is the one that we want to look at today. This is the dispensational theologians and dispensational covenants fall into six areas and we'll cover them today but before we do that I think it's important for you to know what dispensationalism is dispensation is a means by which to explain or look at the unfolding of God's work in time and space in history Dispensationalism. The word is used in scripture and the categories that are represented in the dispensational scheme are biblical categories. In other words, the Bible calls these areas out specifically. They were called out by prophets in history and therefore we can see them, know them and explain them because they're biblical. So let's take a look at this. The covenant of God or the councils of eternity. When we say the councils of eternity, we're talking about that which took place with the Godhead to determine what God's purposes will be in his creation. Before there was a creation, there was this council. The council of the Godhead. I love the title, councils of of eternity because it speaks of an awesome God who is outlaying his purpose in time and space. God is at work. The outworking of God is evident in the revelation of God. 66 books, 40 different authors that articulate the mind and purpose of God. Stay with me. God is speaking and has spoken. The issue is, are you listening and are you doing uh, what you are told? That's the issue. And so God has spoken and he has revealed some things to us. Here's what the Bible says. The secret things belong to God, but that which has been revealed belongs to us and our sons. And so that which God has revealed to us is what God wants us to know about himself. The revelation is about God. 
covenant theologians will tell you that the revelation and the purpose of God is for salvation of men. How many of you know that's partly true? And certainly the Bible speaks to that. But the greater purpose of God, as explained and articulated by uh, dispensationalists, to which I am one, is that God's purpose is to glorify himself. Right. It's to glorify himself. We see that in Ephesians. For the praise and the glory of his grace. That's why he did all of this. That he might receive praise and glory. And so we have come now to dis explaining and articulating what is dispensationalism. And I think that's a good place for us to start today. And we'll go on for another 15 minutes or so and then I'll have to run. What is dispensationalism? Dispensationalism provides a distinction in the outworking of God's relationship with man in history. A distinction of God's work or outwork with man in history. When I go to crying, my nose gets messed up. Forgive me. So it's a distinction. It looks at the scriptures and helps us to see the flow and the distinction of God's relationship with men. It's not the same. How it started with Adam is not how it is with us today. So there it makes those distinctions. It helps us to see. And we're flying high now. Stay with me. We're up here. We're looking. And we got a divine perspective. We're seeing how God sees it from that point of view. Now, I want you to know that God's view is much deeper and greater than ours. Because as we see this in terms of a larger perspective, we have trouble with the details. Either we see the details, we get lost in the weeds, or we're up here and we're seeing and we don't see all the details, we just see the larger picture. But with God, he sees it all simultaneously. He's called omniscient. That means all-knowing. God knows everything, past, present, and future, simultaneously. That's our God. That's who you serve. And so dispensationalism is a theological means by which we make a distinction of those historical relationships that God has with man. All right? Dispensations supply the need for distinctions in the orderly progress of revelation. In the orderly process of revelation. These things are not happening incidentally or accidentally. They are happening by design and purpose. God knows before it happens, why it happens, and when it happens. Satan knows God's plan to a, a, a measure or a degree. Because God announced it. He announced it in the garden. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, he says, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. At that point, Satan said, ah, God has a plan. And he sets in motion a design or a strategy and a method by which to frustrate the plan of God. How many of you know he's trying to frustrate God's plan? And he's doing everything he can to derail, distract, distort, and disconnect us from God's plan. But at the same time, I want you to know this about Satan and his plan. Every plan that he comes up with, Every strategy that he comes up with and methodology that he comes up with only serves to frustrate him. That's right. It doesn't frustrate God. He can't frustrate God. God knows what he's going to do before he does it. Amen. So he winds up frustrated. He did everything he could to stop the seed. And we've already talked about the seed, hadn't we? We said that the seed is Christ. The seed that he is talking about in Genesis 3 and 15 is Jesus, our Messiah. And all that we see saying Satan do from that point forward is to try to mess with the seed. It happened in Genesis chapter 6 when the angels of the sons of God came down and had sexual relationship with the daughters of men. Why? Because he was trying to block the seed. Right? 
All the way through history, we see Satan trying to mess with the seed right up to the point when they tried to kill all the babies in Jerusalem. Remember? In order to stop the seed. Didn't happen. Seed came anyway. Somebody say amen for the seed. Amen. Because the seed delivered us from sin. And so it is an orderly progress of revelation. The Schofield Bible defines dispensationalism this way. Listen to Schofield. He says this, a dispensation is a period of time during which man is tested in respect of obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. And so we see that each one of these dispensational periods is a period in which God is testing man to obey him. Dr. Ryrie puts it this way. He says, dispensational is a crucial event in which testing and failure and judgment takes place. Every dispensation ends that way. Where there's an event, God establishes a demand or a command. Testing comes. Will you obey? Failure inevitably comes before men will fail every time. And then God judges. Every dispensation that we'll look at. Now, I listed on the board what those seven or, or the seven dispensations are in the dispensational scheme. One is innocence. The dispensation of innocence. That period of time where Adam was innocently involved in a relationship with God with no sin. All right? Then we have conscience. Civil government. Four, the promise of the patriarchal uh, uh, a dispensation. Five is the mosaic. Six is the dispensation of grace to which we are living in right now. And then seven is the millennial dispensation. That is that kingdom of God that is to come. That kingdom of God that is to come. Let's look at these just for a moment. And uh, uh, there is a distinction between the dispensational uh, uh, list that we have, and then we have six of what we call the covenants of dispensationalism, which are those covenants that we talked about that are biblical and historical. We'll talk about that maybe next week. But what I want to do is to deal with these dispensations right now, because I want you to see how God has moved in these dispensations with man distinctively. So let me jump ahead in my notes and uh, deal with these dispensations. Now, hold on just a second. Let me get if I can find it in my notes. This is what you call improvisation, Bernard. I'm improvising. Okay, there are seven dispensations and we, we've called them out. Let's talk about them a little bit. The dispensation of innocence, we find them in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 through Genesis chapter 3 and 6. Write it down and take a look at it later. Then there's the dispensation of conscience. When Adam and Eve developed the capacity or the ability to identify that which is right versus that which is wrong. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 uh, through chapter 8, verse 14. Then there is the dispensation of promise or the patriarchal rule. Genesis chapter 11, verse 10, through Exodus chapter 8, verse 27. Then there's the Mosaic law, the dispensation of Mosaic law. It is Exodus 19, 1 through Acts chapter 1, verse 26. And that's the longest one. When Jesus was on this earth, the Mosaic law was still in place. He kept the law. Remember, he kept the law. And he kept the law and he encouraged people to keep the law while he was here 
on earth. Then there is the dispensation of grace, which takes place in Acts chapter one, uh, chapter two, verse one, the coming of the Holy Spirit, to Revelation chapter nineteen and verse twenty-one. And then there's the millennial, the dispensation of the millennium, the kingdom of God that's coming to earth. The Bible teaches that Christ will reign on this earth for a thousand years. How many of you know that's in scripture? That's in scripture. Covenant theologians do not believe that there's a kingdom that is to come. They're saved. They're our brothers. But they read the scripture and they say no kingdom is coming. Even though the Bible clearly says it is. They believe that the kingdom is now. It's now. Some of you have heard of it. It's dominion theology. Kingdom theology. Where we, we are the kingdom and we're here now. But the Bible says something different. Look at Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1 through 15. Let's look at that very quickly. And we won't stay there long. I just want to give you an overview of the distinction between covenant theologians or theological covenants versus dispensational covenants and, and theological uh, dispensationalists to which I am one. And I teach from that point of view. Now, some of you may say, well, I, I got to leave the church now. But that's okay. That's what we teach. We love you anyway. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 15. When you get there, say amen. amen. That means you're ahead of me, and that's okay. I'd rather wait on, have you wait on me than me waiting on you. All right. This is part of the reason why I use this electronic Bible. I get there pretty quickly. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss of a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon and the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for how long? A thousand years. That's a millennium. That's a millennium. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were complete. After these things, he must be released for a short time. After what things? After the thousand years have been completed. Then I saw a thrones, the thrones, and they sat on them. And judgment was given to them who had been beheaded because of their testimonies of Jesus. And because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast and his image. And had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hands. I want you to see that. Those who do not receive the mark. And it says on their forehead and on their hand. King James says in their forehead and in their hands. I want you to know there's a distinction between on and in. In means it's in you. In you. And aren't we being forced to have something placed in us right now? nanobot technology that's in you so don't take it that's right. Amen. and if you have taken it repent Amen. while you can Amen. 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 for the rest of the dead verse 5 did not come to life until the thousand years were completed this is the first resurrection blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but will be priest of God and of Christ and will reign with him for how long? Who's reigning at that time? It seems like it's biblical to me. And it goes on to say it even more clear, but we don't have time for that right now. And so the millennial... A millennial disposition is clearly represented. What I didn't represent to you yet is the civil government. In Genesis chapter 8 verses 15 through 11 and verse 9. Number one, innocence. This was the point where God said to Adam, keep the garden 
fill and subdue the earth and have fellowship with God. And then one prohibition, do not eat from the tree. All right? That's the, the time of innocence. Number two is the time of conscience. What was the, the, the demand that God gave to them? Do good. Do good. They failed. Mankind failed. Number three, civil government. Fill the earth and he established capital punishment. Told them to fill the earth. This was after the flood. Fill the earth and now capital punishment. Man will now produce fear in animals and animals will have fear of man. That's a brand new dispensation. That wasn't the case in the two previous ones. Men were able to eat meat at that time. It changed. They were vegetarians before then. All right. Thank God for mushrooms, you know. The ones that taste like meat you eat. <laughs> Number four. Number four was the patriarchs. Right? And their promise was stay in the promised land and believe God and obey him. They failed. They failed. Each dispensation has what? Events. Testing. Failure. Judgment. And thus far, I want you to know there's been failure in every dispensation, and judgment has also ensued. Number five, the Mosaic Law. Keep the law and walk with God. Fail. Number six. Number six, we have is the grace of God. That's where we are now. And believers are to believe in Christ and walk with Christ. To believe in Christ and walk with Christ. Event, test, failure, judgment. Many are called, but few are chosen. The Bible asks the question, will I find faith in the earth when he comes? Will he find it? Many will say that they are a part of the family of God and he will say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I don't know you. And every dispensation, men and women, the grace of God shows up. And I want you to know we're in grace right now. And the grace is that you and I have been predestined, chosen to be a part of the family of God. That's not incidental or accidental. That was accomplished at the councils in eternity. Your name was pulled out to be a part of the family of God. That is a privileged position. And it ought to invoke in you an attitude of appreciation and commitment and submission to the authority of God's word. Amen. That you're doing what God called you to do. My priorities changed when I became a citizen of the kingdom of God. Amen. And yours has changed too. And what prevents us from doing the will of God is two things. We don't know or we are in open rebellion to God. And I submit to you, men and women, God will evaluate you on two commands. Were you my witness? Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And you shall be my witnesses. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 and 19. Go. Make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You and I need to be making disciples. Yes, we're saved. Yes, we have escaped the wrath that is to come. Yes, we're under the grace of God and we will go into heaven. But some of us will get there with no rewards. You'll just be in heaven. And God will remind you that you had a chance to lead your loved one to the Lord and you failed to open your mouth. You heard about the ministry 
of the border and you did nothing. You didn't open up all of those coins that I gave you. By the way, everything you have comes from God. Come on. Amen. I don't have that much money. You got what God gave you. And if God gave it to you, he could take it from you. And he could add more too. He only trusts those to whom he knows will do what he wants done with his money. And one thing that keeps us from experiencing the full orb and blessing of God is that we're still selfish when it comes to the filthy lucre. And then number seven is the millennium. What is the requirement in the millennium? Believe Christ, obey Christ, and his government. That's the dispensations. All of those dispensations are clearly seen within scripture. It is deduced, yes, but clearly seen within scripture. Now the covenants of God, and I have listed them here, the covenants of dispensationalism is the Noadic covenant. We have the Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the New covenant. Those are six covenants that are clearly seen within the word of God. Yes. Clearly seen. Uncontested and obvious to anyone who would look and see. But before we deal with that, I want to continue with this definition of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism, the new Schofield expands the definition. Now listen to how he expands it, and I think this is appropriate. The new Schofield Bible adds this. Now the old definition was this. Let's go back to the old. The old said it is a period of time during which a man is tested in respect to obedience to some specific salvation of the will of God. That's in the Schofield Bible. You buy a Schofield Bible, you'll see that definition there. Then there's an expansion that's connected to it. One, a deposit of divine revelation. A deposit of divine revelation. That means it is an act of God. When you see a deposit of the divine, that's not Stephen Broden doing that. that. That's God doing that. Number two, man's stewardship and responsibility to that revelation. You and I are in the dispensation or in this special covenant that God has in the church. And we have a stewardship responsibility to respond to the directives that God has given to his church. You and I are ambassadors of the kingdom. Amen. We represent the mind and purpose of God. And we do that in every aspect of our life and living. In my relationship to my wife, I demonstrate what God expects of marriage. Amen. In my relationship to my children, I demonstrate what God wants in a relationship between the parent and the child. Amen. We have a responsibility to our children now yes. more than ever before. I believe it's always been important, but somehow there's a heightened intensity right now because they're in the target, in the crosshairs of demonic activity and God knows that the only way that we can protect them is in the word of God. Not on a peripheral relationship, on a sometime on and off relationship. It's got to be a consistent relationship with God that defines for my son and for my daughter that their purpose in life is connected to the God of all creation. Amen. And they need to know that as early as they can. I submit to you, it can be done. If John Adams, Quincy John Adams, Quincy, what's his name? John Quincy Adams was an ambassador for the United States of America at 12 years old. How did that happen? His father, John Adams, sat with him daily, taught him how to read, taught him Greek and Hebrew. And at 12 years old, this guy was able to represent the United States in Europe. 
It could be done. I taught my son, Jamal, the first 14 verses that he could quote to you when he was five years old out of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing has come into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. This boy could do that. Don't ask him to do it today. But he might be able to quote Jay-Z. Have mercy, Lord. <laughs> you know, maybe Beyonce, what she has to say, which is nothing. Are you hearing me? I'm suggesting to you that in these laboratories of indoctrination, satanic laboratories of indoctrination called public schools, they are moving our children further and further away from God. And they may not say it to you now, but when they hit 17, 18, 19 years old, I've had it with that. I'm done with your God. I believe in Darwinism. And that's happening across this country, whether you know it or not. I've been asked to come to Tennessee in January to, to speak and to be a part of a panel discussion about what's going on in America. And I'm going to target specifically how we have turned our children over to these academicians who have brainwashed them into believing that there is no God, and that the God of all creation is a fairy tale. A fairy tale. And we've allowed it. Because he's going to the best school, he's going to Harvard, they hate God at Harvard. He's at Princeton. They hate God at Princeton. But you're proud of that. We have been participants in our own demise. So he adds man's stewardship responsibility to that revelation. And then three, the time period during which a dispensation operates. That there is a specific time. Remember, it's time sequence. There's a dispensation that comes to an end. And it usually ends in judgment. In judgment. Here's what Ryrie says. The Greek meaning of the word okonomia, okonomia, from the uh, verb making a message to mean a manager, a regulator, an administrator, a plan. The critical idea of the word okonomia uh, for the dispensationalist is managing or administrating of the office of a household. The household here is the earth. The administrator is God. He is the one who is operating and functioning in the context of what we call dispensations. In the New Testament, the word is translated 20 times, okonomia. Okonomia, in those contexts, is to be a steward. To be a steward. The noun okonomios shows up 10 times, and it means steward or manager, right? We see that in Luke. This noun, okonomia, is the one that we're using here for dispensation. Okonomia means dispensation, stewardship, or administrator. Now, some of you look like you're in a, an academic institution. You are to some extent. You're learning. And sometimes this can be pretty dry. I'm sorry. Get a drink of water. <laughs> Now, go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. I'm about to bring this to a close. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. I want to make my point, then we'll stop. Amen. Verse 10, it says this. With a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of time, that is the summing up of all things, in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth in him. The word administration there is okonomia. 
which means dispensation, which means manager, administrator, or kenomia. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, same book, chapter 3, verse 2. Indeed, if you have heard of the stewardship, or kinomia, if you heard of the stewardship, the administration of God's grace, which was given to me for you. He's making a reference to this dispensation. This dispensation of what? Grace. That's where we are. He said, it was given to me for you. Same chapter, verse 9. He says it again. And to bring to light what is the administration, the dispensation. Do you see it, folks? And so when we say the dispensationalist are those who believe in the literal interpretation of Scripture, and that is one of the distinctiveness of being a dispensationalist, that we believe in the normal, plain interpretation of Scripture. We do not spiritualize, and we do, and we do not allegorize the Scriptures. That's where people get in trouble. And that's where the covenant theologians are. They spiritualize. Now what can I do with someone spiritualizing? That really means this and, and I believe what God is saying is all that, I can't challenge that. Except for somebody steps up and say, well, I read it too and it said this to me and now we got all kinds of confusion. Whereas the dispensationalist says we look at the interpretation of scripture based upon the grammatical, historical, and cultural context. Why? Because we seek meaning. There is no faith without meaning. Let me say that again. You cannot have faith if you don't understand what God is saying. And so we approach the scripture looking at the grammatical structure, the historical context in which it was placed, and the culture that is being uh, the agency through which it is unfolding. Somebody say amen. amen. I understand how the Jewish people look at marriage. It's different from how we look at marriage. Because they had a cultural practice then. You didn't just up and get married like we do. You know, I love you, baby, let's go get married. You know, uh, uh, What they did is that he would go to his father. And he would pay a dowry. And he would wait a certain length of time because he would go back and build a place for he and his wife to go in. And so during that time, they don't see one another. You see, I, that's cultural practice. Amen? And so when God says the bride is coming, he's coming to get his bridegroom. Where is he now? He's building a mansion for us somewhere. The cultural practice explains to us What's happening and why it's happening. It's essential to the meaning of the word of God. I cannot trust God if I don't know what God is saying. Right. That's why he sent some as pastors, teachers. So that we might be equipped to do what? The work of the ministry. And the unfortunate thing is right now, too many of us are depending upon spiritualizing and allegorizing the word of God. And you get into deep trouble with that. Deep trouble with that. God told me that I'm supposed to marry you tonight. You my wife. Right? And she responds, well, God didn't tell me yet. I'm not marrying you till he tell me. And so what we have is confusion like that. God called me into the ministry. God doesn't call somebody who's not prepared. The first call to the ministry is always preparation. Hello. Always preparation. Preparation and availability are inextricably linked together. One cannot be prepared unless he is available. And one cannot be available to God unless he is prepared. Amen? And so we need to know what God says and how God calls us. And all of us have a calling on our lives in this dispensation. In order to understand it, men and women, we need to have the plain interpretation of Scripture. 
The Bible says not let many of you become leaders because there's a, a strict and a deeper consequence when you blow it. Huh? But everybody's called to the ministry, especially in our community. You know, I've been called. Oh, okay. The Bible says lay hands on no man quickly. Observe him, see what they do. And you watch them, you find out very quickly they are not called. Some of us don't discover that until after they've ripped us off, had sex with everybody in the church, and then they say, oh man, he wasn't called. Too late. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's a mess out there. And that's not by accident, that's by design. Satan is always sending wolves into the church. But my Bible says, see to it that no one takes you captive. Through philosophy, empty deception, according to the traditions of men and the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Jesus Christ. In other words, it is my stewardship responsibility to make sure that no one deceives me. How do I do that? Through the filter of the word of God. If it doesn't line up with God's word, you can count on the fact that you're not going to have me following that person. Open your Bible. It's not an accident. This is called the Fair Park Bible Fellowship, John. It's the Fair Park Bible Fellowship because we're standing on the unsinkable word of God. The truth. There's only one truth, God's truth. Where do you find it? Amen. Amen. Lights and walls. Say amen for me. I, I'm not hearing nothing out here. Might as well depend upon them. And so we look at the literal interpretation. What is this sine qua non of dispensationalism? That word means the indispensable truth. Several. The dispensationalist keeps Israel and the church distinct. They're not the same. They're not the same. Follow me on this because this is important. Because there's a lot of people that believe that God is through with Israel. And that the church has taken its place. Are you hearing me? The sine qua non for us is that there's a distinction between the church and Israel. They're not the same. Number two. The literal interpretation of scriptures a hermeneutics that seeks the normal or plain interpretation no spiritualizing no allegorizing of the word we use a historical and grammatical and cultural context to find and discover the meaning of the word of God number three God's purpose is defined as more than salvation The greater purpose is to bring glory and honor to God. How you live brings glory and honor to God. Who you are listening to brings glory and honor to God. And so men and women, we're dispensationalists. I am, and I hope that you are too. That we are standing unflinchingly on the word of God. And the time demands that right now. You say, well, Pastor, why are you giving us this kind of teaching? It sounds like something you'd teach at a seminary. It is. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm just going over the surface. I didn't go deep on this. I, it's a lot more here, but I'm not going to take you that deep because I don't want you to go to sleep. But why am I doing this? And I'm going to say this and I'm going to close. Because I believe the time demands that you know what you believe and why you believe it. What you believe and why you believe it. The time for peripheral Christianity is over. It's done. It got us nothing. Look what it has done in America. Nothing. Christianity has lost its influence. We are scoffed at, laughed at, and ridiculed publicly. And we got preachers who have capitulated to the nomenclature of the culture. Have capitulated fully. We're closing their churches right now. Telling their people, go get the jab. Because we're afraid you might bring that stuff up in here. 
The Bible reminds us that's not from God. When you're operating in fear, that's from Satan. And this culture and those who control this culture are operating fear in the public square to get us to a place where they can implement what is called the global reset. It's coming. It's coming. I was reading in the scripture. The Bible says to the nation of Israel because they had turned on God and they began to worship idols and sacrifice their children at the altar of Satan. He says to Jeremiah, he says, even if Noah and Samuel were standing here today, I would not listen to them on their behalf. Don't pray for them. Do you know God says not to pray for them? See, some of us are sitting around here praying, oh God, let's have, have mercy so we can have America be the same as it was before. Where I have a fact check, you know, this wonderful vacation time, three cars and two and a half kids. That got us nothing. But that's what people are praying for. They're praying that, oh, if we can get back the way it was. No. The way it was is the reason why we are the way we are. Are you hearing me? God is an ancillary consideration for too many of us right here. You who are sitting here right now, you still determine whether you want to go to church or not or who you listening to at church. I'm going to tell you, some of the things that you're getting in some of these churches, you know it's not right. That's right. That's right. How can you be talking about how to have a happy and meaningful life when the culture is raw and ranch and ranch and ranch it? How can you? But that's what some brothers are preaching now, how to be successful and how you can have a happy life. That's not from God. God said, I did not put my words in their mouth. They're not from me. I'm going to tell you, right now, too many of us are on the peripheral, the periphery of the faith. We're peripheral in our relationship with God. It's got to stop. So that's why I'm preaching this, so that you can know what you believe and why you believe. This is a bird's eye view. God is at work. Each one of those dispositions shows and has come to a conclusion or a failure. Failed Adam, failed Adam, failed the nations, failed the patriarchs, failed the nation of Israel, and now we're under grace, and the truth of the matter, the church is failing too. Well, how could that be? Go to the border, and you'll see failure. This administration has sanctioned that stuff. They're making you get a jab, but none of them are coming over here are being forced to get a jab at all. You know what they're getting? A check. A place to stay and shipped anywhere they want to go in America at your expense. Your money's doing that and nobody's saying nothing but a few of us who are crying out and we are talked about as being on the lunatic fringe. Old Broden has gone over again. There he goes, off into the wilderness. No, I'm not going left. I'm just doing what God says. Raise the flag. Tell the truth. Sound the alarm. Shout it out. And that's what we've been doing. And, and you don't win friends and influence people like that, John. You don't. You lose them. Even your friends, you know, after a while get tired of hearing you. Right. Right. That's okay. That's okay. Don't even pray for them. You know what that says to me? You need to know how to pray. How do you pray right now? How do you pray right now? What should you be praying for? Well, I'm glad you ask. You need to be praying for an opportunity to share the truth with somebody. To help them to escape that which is about to come. Yes. You need to pray that God will send somebody across your path. You need to pray that the will of God may be manifested first in my life. 
Help me, Father, to be an obedient servant. Not to know the truth and do nothing about it. To know the truth and not do anything about it. Too many of us know the truth, but we're not doing it. We don't submit to our husbands, wives. Husbands, we're not loving our wives as Christ loves the church. We're not doing it. Children, obey your parents and Lord, not doing it. And you sitting up in here in church acting like you love Jesus. God says, I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't know you. Because you're not doing what you're supposed to do. The time for peripheral Christianity is over. How many things have pushed God down to second place in your life? I'm just going to ask you that question. For too many of us, it's sporting events, cowboys, Michigan. I like Michigan. But he doesn't take place over God. God comes first. Your children takes place over God. He gave you that baby. He gave you that child. And I'm going to tell you what happens. Your telephone takes precedent and priority over God. You're too busy trying to find out what's going on. Sitting in church looking at the sports page. Are you really here? You're not. And God knows you're not. He said, I was in church. No, you weren't. You weren't here. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I can go on forever. I'm going to miss my flight. Father... These are unusual times. The tumult is before us, troubling in every way. And so we call upon you, O oh God, to open our eyes that we may see, our ears that we may hear what the Spirit of God is saying in this moment, in this hour. There are things right now that are pressing in on us, Father. The tyranny of urgency has blinded so many of us from the fact and the truth of what you are doing. Help us, Father, not to be distracted. Help us to know what our priorities are. Our priority is the kingdom. Jesus says, pray this way. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. In my life as it is in heaven. Help me to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. Put aside all the distractions, and we know what they are. Our jobs, the urgency of whatever is taking place in our lives, sometimes get in the way of my priority of God. You are my priority, O oh God. Not my car, not my home, not washing my teeth, although I should. But you are my priority. In Jesus' name, amen. I went longer. What time is my flight, Steph? What time is my flight? Five o'clock. Okay, I still got a little time. It's offering time. Jamal, will you pass the offering? I want you to do something special for me today. For those of you who can, and all, if you can't, I understand. God knows. If you can give just a little bit more so we can give Stephanie something as she goes out of here to the border of uh, Texas and Mexico. She, she's amazing that she would go down there. I don't know what she, you don't have a team, do you? She's going by herself. Uh, and she's going to praise, praise God at the border to make herself available to some of these children that are sitting under these bridges being exploited. I don't know what the strategy is, but I know this, money can make it happen. Amen. Wise administration and wise use of cash can make it happen. You know, Jesus carried a, a money box around with him. He just had it in the wrong man's hands. He had it in Jewish, Judas's hand. Amen? Amen. We, I'm sorry. I needed to end this with you. But I'm glad you stayed on. Because you heard my heart. My heart is that we are, uh, are called to this moment to be diligent consistent and faithful to the call of God on our lives that we might advance the kingdom of God here on this earth. I trust that you have been challenged to do so today. That you've learned something about the distinction between theological covenants and dispensational covenants. 
We will continue this in our meeting next week, and we ask that you come along and join us as we continue to investigate and understand the will and purpose of God for the church, God's people. Thank you for joining us. God bless. Amen. Amen. Spirit of the living God.